After months of searching, police in Kenya are still recovering bodies of members of a starvation cult who died near Malindi. Investigators have already found more than 400 victims and fear there could be many more. Many of those already recovered from the ground were children. The pastor who convinced them they would meet Jesus if they starved themselves to death is in police custody awaiting trial. DW's Felix Maringa met a cult member who fled before it was too late. Salama Masha is rebuilding her life after a close brush with death. She was in a cult in eastern Kenya on track to starve her children and herself in a bid to meet Jesus. It all started with worries about vaccines and concerns that a new government ID card was collecting too much information. During the corona period, the preacher told us that we needed to go live in the wilderness. He said the government ID cards would come and that everyone needed to be careful since the chips were evil. So the gospel started creeping into me. But my husband had already bought into the narrative of the conspiracies. They moved to this forested area where they and other families built houses and started farming. What little news they got from outside was alarming. We were told that people were being given government ID cards. There were forced vaccinations out there. But the preacher told us to continue farming. He even encouraged us to plant banana plantations, which would help us survive longer. A year into their time in the forest, things turned. One lady told everyone that we were running out of time. There was no time to continue farming. It was time to fast, pray, and eventually meet Jesus. So the message came that we needed to force the kids to start fasting. At first, they just fasted during the day. But then her husband, who was a church official, said their cooking spot should stay cold. They should not eat again. I asked him how the kids would fast if there was food inside the house. He said the kids needed to fast and that they would eat once they died and met Jesus. She discovered that when her husband was out during the day, he was burying people who had starved themselves to death, those bodies which authorities are now digging up. When she then saw another woman's badly malnourished children, she had a crisis of faith. So I decided to go pray for a whole week. That's when I felt I was going to die. That's when I said I would talk to my husband and tell him these prayers were meant to kill us and not to take us to Jesus. And there was no difference with people who hang themselves, I told him. I was not willing to go on. My husband told me that I was wasting time and that the kids would be wayward and that they would be forcefully injected with vaccines and once injected, it would be a direct ticket to hell. She left for her parents' village. Her husband stayed in the forest where she had he died. Authorities took her children away, but they are alive. When my kids left here, they were very thin and malnourished. I haven't seen them since they were taken to foster care. Salama has found a job at a vegetable farm in the village. She says she's doing much better than when she first arrived. My face looked so pale. I've actually regained my health. I was malnourished. I was so thin my clothes didn't fit. I even had sunken eyes. She's rebuilding her life, waiting to get her children back and start a life away from the deaths and self-inflicted hunger. My next guest leads the human rights NGO that helped expose the Shakahola cult. Hussein Khalid is the executive director of Haki Africa, based in Kenya. He joins us now from Mombasa. Welcome to DW News Africa, Hussein. How could this have gone on so long without the authorities being aware in Kenya? Yes, um, I think that's the million dollar question that we are all asking. And uh, 
Of course, there are various uh, reasons behind that uh, or justifications that are being fronted by the authorities. But of course, that does not um, uh, explain what truly happened. Uh, one of the excuses they are giving is that this is a far off place, uh, probably 80, 90 kilometers from the nearest uh, town. Uh, the, the guy was very careful in deciding where he wants to uh, undertake this operation. Uh, there are also excuses that uh, in that area, uh, churches and religious institutions are known for uh, accusing each other falsely. So they're saying when they received uh, some of this information, of course, to them it appeared far-fetched mm. and they thought it's uh, the, no, the usual uh, allegations that are leveled against uh, church leaders. And how did you become aware of what was happening in the Shakahola forest? So one of the programs that we undertake as Haki Africa is the Rapid Response Project. And under this project, uh, we receive complaints uh, related to human rights issues from members of the public and other individuals out there. So this matter was reported to us uh, at our Malindi office by uh, a grandfather who had already claimed that uh, two of his grandchildren had been killed and a third one was going to be killed. So when he reported the matter to us, of course, we took it very, very seriously. Uh, together with him, we accompanied him to the police. But as I said, the police disregarded uh, the, the, the complaint. And they told us, even as Haki Africa, to ignore what uh, had been reported to us. But we didn't. And we decided to take the matter forward. We visited uh, this area. And it is at that level when we also confirmed that truly uh, mm. that something is amiss and that action needs to be taken. And Hussein, the, the man accused for orchestrating this cult, Pastor Paul McKenzie, he's in custody. What is he saying? Well, according to him, he said that uh, he did not force anyone to do anything that they didn't want to do. That uh, he is a, a, a priest, there is a, a calling, and he was actually uh, merely uh, communicating what uh, you know the word of God is. And that those people who decided to fast did that voluntarily, and uh, that he did not, uh, you know, uh, in any way force anyone into it. So he is claiming that uh, he had a mission and the mission was to save as many people as possible to make sure they go to heaven. So he is sticking to his teachings. He is sticking to his word. And, hmm. uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is that we are not seeing any kind of remorse from his end. I want to come back to the charges he's likely facing, but on the point about him sticking to his message, some of the witnesses have said that followers of the cult had to pay money to stay in the forest. Was there more to this than extreme religion? I mean, was there extortion here, masquerading as religion? So what we know is that uh, uh, the, the, the cult was uh, convincing their members, that they have nothing to do with this world anymore, that they're being prepared to go to heaven. So all their worldly possessions, they were asked to sell them so that uh, they can generate income to contribute to the efforts of the church. You know, so we have many people who uh, like sold their land, sold their housewares, sold their uh, possessions so that they could get this money. And what we understand is that this money was then handed over uh, to the pastor and what charges then is Pastor Paul McKenzie likely facing? So initially when he was arrested, um, he uh, was uh, taken to court uh, on charges of uh, murder and related uh, issues. But then the police uh, felt that that did not truly capture uh, what had transpired because then it would have been difficult to attach him to any of uh, the, the, the deaths because most of those deaths, as we have seen from the autopsies, were from starvation. So um, they decided to change uh, those charges and they are now charging him with terror-related uh, criminal charges, you know, from uh, ide ideologies to uh, preaching uh, death and even convincing uh, individuals to commit mass suicide. So these are all allegations that uh, are possibly uh, could be, uh, he could face. But as I said, uh, the investigations are still going on. The last time he was brought to court, the prosecution uh, requested to be given more time to actually uh, confirm the charges, to, con to finish with the investigations. So we will be uh, expecting him to be arraigned in court uh, to take plea in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Hussein, 
I just want to tap into a debate that's raging in the country uh, in the aftermath of, of this discovery. Um, is there the feeling in Kenya that, that pastors, religious leaders have, have too much power in the country? Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, this is what we, as the organization that uh, has been on the ground that uh, discovered this issue, are uh, advocating for. You see, in Kenya presently, anyone can just wake up one day and decide to start a church or a mosque or a religious institution. We uh, don't have strict uh, regulations on how to manage or control or even evaluate religious institutions. And uh, as Haki Africa, we are appealing to the state authorities to introduce regulations uh, so that, uh, you know, a person can just cannot just wake up one day and uh, lead his followers on a suicide path. So we have seen the act government taking action. They have set up uh, a task force to look into this issue. We are saying in the minimum, in the minimum, we should have self-regulation of the religious sector. Even if uh, it's not regulation by the state or any other uh, uh, department, then in the minimum, we must have uh, regulation, self-regulation, where the religious leaders themselves can watch over each other, mm -hmm. can just make sure that the messages that each one of them is sending out there are messages that are, you know, uh, abide by the religious teachings that are normal to any person out there. Hussein Khalid, Executive Director of Haki Africa, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.